Hi, this is section 6.2, which is called Using the Normal Distribution. We're going to build on what we talked about in section 6.1, and we did talk about something called a standard normal distribution. And we talked about our normal distribution being our bell-shaped curve. And we talked about how, if you think of this as a histogram, those little bars would be going from a low value, a low frequency, up to a maximum, and then back down. So I almost think of this as a bunch of bars from a histogram. And again, your frequencies start low, they increase to a max, and then they come back down. So there's our normal distribution. When it also is standard, our mean is zero and our standard deviation is one. And we talked about these and when you have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, your standard normal distribution, you would have a Z score along the bottom. Now, we're going to refer to the area under this curve as the sum of all the probabilities. So remember when we started off, we did our discrete probability distributions and we said these all would add up to one. Well, now we have a continuous probability distribution and we can't list them all because there's an infinite number. So we're gonna say, we know they all add up to one because it's the sum of the probabilities. And this area equaling one, we're gonna connect finding probabilities with finding areas under the curve. That's what this is gonna be about. So probability is going to be connected to the area under the curve. And the sum of all those equals one. When we were working with empirical rule, I'll just put this over on the side. Empirical rule, there we go. We talked about percentages, 68% and 95% and 99.7%. Well, remember, a percent could be written as a decimal. So if we're asked for a probability, we use the decimal form. If we're asked for a percentage, we use the percentage form. So percent probability. And you'll notice most of the questions are gonna ask you to find the probability. So remember probability goes from zero to one. It's typically gonna be a decimal value in between zero and one. Okay, there is a notes sheet for this um, that we're gonna reference in just a few minutes. Um, I want to give you for your notes though, the calculator functions so that you can get them written down and then when I pull up the calculator and model them, you will have it written down already and you can reference it. So right now I'm just gonna write down the process that we're gonna use for the calculator and I want you to write it down so you have it to reference later, okay? So I'm gonna put here the calculator functions that we're gonna use. And Prior to the graphing calculator, we would look up these areas on a table. And if any of you have had calculus, calculus is basically finding the area under a curve. So using empirical rule, using calculus, using that idea, this table was made. Well, our calculators now have the formulas programmed into them so that we don't have to reference it on the table. 
So we're going to have two different things that we may be doing here. One thing is finding probability. So it might say find the probability that um, something is greater than five. Find the probability that something is less than negative two, something like that. So you could find a probability. It may ask you to find a percent as well. The probability would be the decimal. Move the decimal two places to get to your percent. And for these, you'll be given um, a value on the number line. And I'm writing this down because a lot of times that's where students have a hard time is figuring out which function to use. So they'll give you a number on your number line to work with. And what we're going to do, we're going to do the second key and then we're going to hit the vars key. And when you hit second vars, what you're getting is a distribution key. We're working with a normal distribution. And I'll show you this on the calculator. I just want you to get it written down first. When we get to that, we're going to choose number two, which says normal CDF. And what that stands for is a normal cumulative distribution function. It's adding up those probabilities accumulate a cumulative like a cumulative GPA so it's adding them up and when we choose this function we're gonna have to enter and I'll show you how to do this the left boundary of the shaded region the right boundary of the shaded region the mean which will be given to us and the standard deviation and I'll show you how to do that, whether you have stat wizard or not on your calculator. So that's one function that we're going to use a lot, this normal CDF. The second one that we're going to approach, this would be a situation where they give you the probability or the percent and they want you to find the number on the number line. Typically, it's phrased as find the cutoff value or find the value that separates this area. So I'm going to put here um, to find cutoff value. And over here, I'll say you're given the percent or the probability. And again, we're going to go to distribution. So we're going to go to second vars variables. And we're going to choose, that's having us choose that distribution. It's the second function on that key. And we're going to choose number three. And number three is inverse norm. I don't usually capitalize the N, but it is capitalized in your calculator. And what you will enter is the area to the left of the cutoff value. And I'll have to show you on the newer 84s, it has some other options. I would just stick with area to the left though. And then the mean and the standard deviation. So I would, as you're working with these problems, have this in front of you. And also, some of you may be thinking about the test already. You're allowed to use your formula packet. And these are on the formula packet in the section on the front page. I'm looking at my formula packet right now. Um, the section on the front page that says normal distribution. So if you look down at the bottom there, it has um, the normal CDF 
and the inverse normal. So you don't have to memorize it. You just have to know how to use it. Okay. So I want to look at the notes sheet next. And after I look at the notes sheet, I'm going to um, switch over to the calculator. I would have the notes sheet in front of you so you can write on it, but I need to have the calculator screen up. So let me just pause for a second. So this is what the notes sheet looks like. Um, looking at this, um, we're going to do this first page while we're looking at the calculator. Um, so that you can see here, you're going to be drawing, drawing a picture for each problem and showing what you entered in the calculator to be able to get the result. Also notice it tells you that you have a standard normal distribution. As soon as you have that word standard in there, that means you know your mean is zero and your standard deviation is one. So keep that in mind. So I would, as you're writing, you're gonna work directly on this sheet. And then um, when we get to the second page, I will write on the sheet as well. I just wanna make sure you know how to input these into the calculator. Okay, one more pause and I'll pull up the calculator. Okay, I think we're ready to go now. So you should have your notes sheet in front of you and I'm gonna show you how to find the probabilities um, by drawing a picture and using the calculator, okay? So you can see here, I need to clear this out. Okay, um, we talked about the different calculator functions. Here is VARS and distribution you can see is the second function on that. So that's the one we're gonna be using. Um, and let's do this, let's see. The first one we're gonna do, it says find, this is number one A, it says find the probability that Z is less than negative 2.5, okay? It asks you to draw a picture. The picture is the key to everything when you're doing these. On your homework, you're gonna see, I require the picture. Students who try to do this without drawing the picture have a really hard time. And that's not to say it's impossible to do without drawing a picture, but it's gonna be a lot easier if you can see the picture. So when I read this, it says, we're given a standard normal distribution. So I say, okay, I know I have a normal distribution. There's our normal distribution, bell-shaped curve. It's standard, which means the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So that's what I start off with. Now, when we look at this picture, it says, Z is less than, see this? This is a less than symbol. Notice that it looks kind of like an arrow. So that means it's gonna be the values to the left of negative 2.5. So I know zero is right here in the middle. So my negative 2.5, I'm not even gonna worry about making it to scale. I just know it's over here. It's to the left of zero. So here's my negative 2.5. And I want to find the probability that a number Z is less than that. So I'm gonna shade this part right here. And this would, you know, keep going You can kind of see. So I want to find the area of that shaded region. And the area of that shaded region is going to represent the probability. We're connecting area and probability. The other thing you can do from a common sense standpoint, we know that area under the curve is one. This whole thing is one. Well, if I cut it in half, the right side would be 0.5, the left side would be 0.5. Can you see that this area is going to be quite a bit smaller than 0.5? And I didn't even draw it to scale. So we don't know what this is gonna be, but we know it's gonna be 
pretty small area. Okay, I probably should have done some scale. So now we're trying to find a probability. Well, when you look at your calculator functions, when we're trying to find a probability, we're going to use normal CDF calculator. And when we use normal CDF, I want you to write down your calculator function. And we said here, normal CDF, you're given the number on the bottom, which we have, and you're trying to find the probability or the percent. And what we want to enter here is the left or the lower boundary. And I'll show you what I mean by that. The right, the mean, and the standard deviation. Left boundary, if you look at this picture, this shaded region, the lower boundary is here, the upper boundary is here. We're kind of looking at if we read this from left to right, what would section off that area? So we know the right number is negative 2.5. To find the left number, this goes on infinitely. We don't really know where it stops. If you think of this being a number line, you know, it goes on infinitely. So this number here, what we typically will use is a very small negative number. So I'll use like negative 9999. Some of you, if you have the TI-84, you'll see it puts in a really small number for you. But what we're looking at there, and if we're trying to find this area, the smallest boundary is the negative 9999. I'm just using that to show negative infinity. I have to put something in the calculator. And the right boundary is negative 2.5. The mean is 0. And the standard deviation is 1. What I would suggest for showing your work, write this word and write those four numbers. That way I can grade it and I can look at left boundary, left boundary, right boundary, mean, standard deviation. Okay? So now let's see how to put this in the calculator. We're going to go again. We want to do second VARs so we can get to that distribution. So we're going to go second VARs. We're going to go to normal CDF. We want them to add up all the um, areas, the cumulative distribution function. And now we're going to enter the lower boundary. And you could put in more than four nines. You, could bit, you just want a really, really tiny number to give the idea of negative infinity. Um, negative 2.5, 0, and 1. Okay. Now we're getting a probability. And we're expecting it to be a fairly small probability. And this is what we get, 0 0.0062. So our answer here would be 0 0.00620969999. Most of the time we round these to four places, so 0 0.0062. So the probability that Z is less than negative 2.5 is 0 0.0062. If we were going to make that a percent, we'd move it two places to the right, but it didn't ask for a percent. It asked for a probability. So this is our work. Now, when I grade something like this, I'm looking for the picture, the normal CDF with the numbers, and the answer. Students try to do it without the picture. The picture is the key. Write the picture down. <laughs> It makes a difference, I'm telling you. Okay, let's look at letter B. So now we're looking at the second one here. It says, find the probability that Z is greater than 1. And if you think about from our empirical rules stuff, we could probably figure that out because it's one standard deviation from the mean. Um, we know we have a standard normal distribution. So we're going to draw a picture. There's our normal distribution. Yeah, that one doesn't look too bad. Our mean is zero. Our standard deviation is one. And this one says, 
Where's my color here? This one says Z is greater than one. So see how the arrow, if you make the um, inequality symbol look like an arrow, it's pointed to the right. So if we were to go to one, and it says greater, oh, actually I wrote it down wrong. It says less than one, I'm sorry. I wrote that one down wrong. We'll do a greater than one coming up. Less than one. Good thing I caught that, because it would have been scratching your head, huh? Okay, Z is less than one. So we're looking for this area here. And you can see that's a pretty big area. It's more than half. So we're expecting an answer higher than 0.5. So again, we're trying to find a probability. So we're going to do normal CDF. And again, this goes on infinitely. So this we're going to put negative 9999, just a really small number. And then the left boundary, the right boundary is 1. So you go left to right. The mean is 0. The standard deviation is 1. And actually, your calculator will default to the mean of 0 and the standard deviation of 1. But I like you to write it in because you get used to that. And these are just the first examples. We're going to do examples where you don't have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay, so we can go over to our calculator and we want to do second distribution, normal CDF. And we're going to go negative 9999. Again, if you throw another one in there, that's fine, um, comma. 1 comma 0 comma 1. And look at that area. It's 0 0.8, 0 0.8413447404. Again, typically we do four decimal places. That's what the table would give back in the day. Okay. Now, I hadn't shown you stat wizard yet. Let me show you if your calculator's in stat wizard mode, how this might look different. So if you have an 83, you don't have that option. If you have an 84, let's go to stat wizard. So I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna click that on. So now when I go to normal CDF, see how it looks different? It's telling you what, oops, what's your lower boundary. And it's automatically putting in negative 1 to the 99th power is a really, really tiny, tiny number. It'd be negative 1 and then add 99 zeros. You can write over that if that's not your lower boundary. You'd put in your upper boundary, which in this case was 1. Mean of zero, standard deviation of one, they have in there because that's the most common. You will have to overwrite that if the mean and standard deviation are not zero and one. And then when you do paste, you notice it looks like the form we had before. They just put that lower number in there and you get the same answer. So it's up to you which way you prefer. Some students like having the stat wizard. Um, I have a TI-83, so I don't have that option. And if you have an 83, you'll have to input it with the commas. Okay, let's do letter C. So letter C says probability that Z is greater than 1.25. Why don't you start drawing your picture while I erase away here. So we're going to say this is 1C, and it's the probability that Z is greater than 1.25. So this is the first one with the greater than. If we were using the table, these can be kind of tricky. They're pretty easy with the calculator, though. So we have a normal distribution, mean of 0, standard deviation of 1. 
And looking at this, it says Z is greater than 1.25. So if this is one, then maybe this is 1.25. And it says greater than. So it would be that area. Again, we're connecting area under the curve to probability. So we're going to do normal CDF. And we're going, if we look at this again, 1.25 is the left boundary, the lower boundary. If I'm reading a book or reading a graph, I start over here. Oh, my shaded region is, has boundaries of 1.25. And then on the right, it keeps going and going because this is a number line. So this would keep going and going, and this would get smaller and smaller, and it would keep going and going. So what we have to do here, we really have infinity, but we're going to estimate that by just putting a big number. Okay. So our left boundary is 1.25. Our right boundary is 9999. Our mean is zero, our standard deviation is one. Okay. Um, you can see again, and I think it's smart to do this. We're expecting an area that's smaller than half, right? We're expecting to be pretty small, less than half for sure. All right. I think I'm in stout wizard, but that's okay. I'm going to go to normal CDF. My lower boundary is 1.25. It's not down here, it's over here. So I can just put in the 1.25. My upper boundary is really big. However many nines you wanna put in there. Mean is zero, standard deviation of one. Oh. <laughs> and we get 0 0.1056. So this first part is getting used to drawing the picture, getting used to using the calculator. We are going to do some applications coming up, um, but we want you to get comfortable with this. Yes, it's a new calculator function, but a lot of times students are more comfortable with this than the probabilities we did in chapter three. This is a very specific process. Draw the picture, put in the mean and the standard deviation shade your area, normal CDF. So it's pretty straightforward in that sense. You just need practice to get more comfortable with it. Okay, let's look at D. So D is going to go over here. So letter D, go ahead and get your picture drawn while I get mine drawn. Probability that Z is greater than negative 1.96. And as I was writing that, um, just a reminder, a lot of times students, um, I shouldn't say a lot of times, there are often students that have a hard time interpreting the greater than and the less than symbols. Um, what you want to keep in mind here, with that symbol, the bigger part is by the wide open part. See how that's like a little point? That is the smaller value. Also, if your variable's on the left, you can think of this as an arrow, like I said, and that will help you with your shape. Okay, so it says Z is greater than negative 1.96. Mean of zero, standard deviation of one. Negative 1.96. So this would be negative 1, negative 2. So maybe negative 1.96 is about here. Again, it really isn't a huge issue as far as making it a perfect scale. Just make sure this is 0. So make sure relative to the 0, a negative is going to be on the left, positive is going to be on the right. And then this says greater than, so we're shading the area to the right the values that are greater than negative 1.96. And again, this keeps going all the way out to infinity, which we're going to do 99999 or bigger. So can you see that area is pretty big? It should be higher than 0.5. So let's see what we get. We're going to do normal. 
DDF, negative 1.96, 9999, mean is zero, standard deviation of one. Okay, we've done, this is our fourth one. Getting a little um, more routine already, I'm sure. Okay, so we're gonna go second. And you know what, let me take off the stat wizard for this one. distribution, normal CDF, and we're going to go negative 1.96, uh, 9999, 0, 1. 0.9750. We said it was going to be a big probability. So you think about this probability is very close to one. It's almost the whole shaded area. It would be a high likelihood of happening, whatever it's representing. Um, something that's crossing my mind here. Every once in a while, students will get these um, switched. They'll flip flop them for whatever reason. And I wanna show you what happens with that. So let's say somebody accidentally switched the order of those. See how it has a negative? This is representing probability. You can't have a negative. So when you see that, that tells you you did something wrong. Sometimes students will write that result up here and it tells me they're really lost. I mean, it tells me volumes that they really don't understand what's going on. They're just kind of blindly putting things in their calculator. So remember, you're getting a probability. A probability is from zero to one. If you don't get a number between zero and one, go back to the drawing board. You must have done something wrong. Okay, let's do letter E. And we're almost ready to get to the fun ones, the ones that are applications. No, 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 no. Okay, so letter E says the probability that one is less than Z is less than two. This is a less than, and this is a less than. Z is in between one and two. Z is bigger than one, Z is smaller than two. So when we draw this one, it looks like it's going to be harder. It's actually going to be easier. We know our mean is zero. We know our standard deviation is one. And we have Z, which is along this scale again, being in between one and two. Well, here's one. Here's two. Z is that little slice in between. Okay. We're trying to find the probability that the value lands in between one and two. So we'll do normal CDF. And again, this is your work. Make sure you show that. It's easier because you have your left boundary, your right boundary. You don't have to um, deal with the positive infinity or negative infinity. So now let's go to our normal CDF. We have one, two, zero, one. Oops, I didn't hit zero, did I? Zero. Delete, 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 delete. All right. Two, zero. <laughs> Point one three five nine. Oops. Oh, oh there it goes. <laughs> um, point one three five nine. Okay. So we've done four examples 
all using normal CDF. And you'll notice on these examples, they always had numbers along the bottom, and we were finding that shaded area. Okay, and that shaded area represents the probability. I'm going to clear this off, and we're going to look at number two. And this one is an example of inverse normal. So on number two, it says find the cutoff values. For the top 2% and the bottom 2%. We still have a standard normal distribution. So there's our normal distribution. It's standard, which means the mean is zero. The standard deviation is one. And it says, find the cutoff values. Okay, we don't have anything else. Well, we know it's the top 2% and the bottom 2%. So the top 2% would be these higher values over here. And we're trying to find a number to go in that box that will cut off the top 2%. And the same thing on the other end, the bottom 2%, and again, this would slowly go down, that's 2%. Um, we wanna find that number. And I think looking at this, you can see zeros in the middle. This number is going to be positive. This number is going to be negative. Okay. When you look at the notes on inverse normal, I had it referenced, and I'm actually looking to find the cutoff value. You're given a probability or a percent. Well, in this case, we are given a percent and we want to find the cutoff values. Well, when you're given a percent, anytime you work with a percent, you want to write it as a decimal. So this is the top 2.02 .02 would be that area. And this is 0.02 .02 would be that area. And the way that I think of cutoff values, I'm going backward. I don't have this number down here. I have that probability already and I'm going backward. So I'm going to do, um, I'll do it down here, I guess, inverse normal. And then we want to enter the area to the left. The mean and the standard deviation. So inverse normal, I'll put the numbers in now. The area to the left, let's do this one first. 0 0.02, the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. Okay, um, let's see, so let's go over here. We're gonna go to distribution. We're gonna go to inverse normal, oops. And we're gonna put 0 0.02, zero, one. And remember, we're expecting a negative number because it's along the number line and it's smaller than zero. And the number is negative 2.05. I want you to think about it. I guess I could try to squeeze it in there. What do you think this number is? Remember the symmetry idea? This number is going to be positive 2.5. And that only happens when you have zero in the middle. But that's, that's a nice feature. Um, let's say you didn't notice the symmetry and you wanted to find that one the same way. So now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to kind of look at it like this. And you guys may not need this, but I think it'll help down the road. 
So we said this was 2% or 0 0.02. And we want to find this cutoff value. And the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. OK. When we go to enter this in the calculator, it asks for the area to the left. Okay. On an 83, it has to be area to the left. Mean and standard deviation. Well, we know the mean and the standard deviation. This has been 0 and 1. The area to the left of this cutoff, this cutoff right here. Well, we know the area to the right is 0.02. We know the area under the whole curve is 1. So this would be 1 minus 0 0.02 or 0.98. And if we put that in your calculator now, 0.98 is the area to the left. Um, 0, 1. See, we got the 2.05. 2.05, which we had figured based on symmetry. I'm talking about this maybe more than you think you need because students see this area to the right and they want to put that in there. Um, be careful with that. It's commonly missed. The other thing, though, a way to catch yourself. When you're done, if you have your picture, make sure this number makes sense. If you put in the 0.02, you would have a negative, and you'd really say, wait, negative numbers aren't to the right of zero. Like, look at the numbers along here and make sure they make sense on the number line. Okay, let me show you inverse normal for um, stat wizard. So if you'd like to use stat wizard, and again, I, I'm not as used to it because I use a TI-83. So now, if we go to inverse normal, and... There we go. It'll say what's the area. And then here it says tail. You can choose to the left, to the center, or to the right. So you could pick the area to the right being 0.02. I think I just always leave it on left and everybody's doing it the same way. But if you want, you can change it to right and put in like whatever you're given. So the area to the right is 0.02. Oh, hang on. Let me change it. Hang on, that wasn't cleared out. Got the same answer. Now. I just recommended those, leaving it on left. Sometimes that's one more thing to worry about. If you just think, I'm always doing the area to the left, 0.98 is the area to the left. There you go. So just remember, your calculator's going to do what you tell it. You're the brain. It's just doing the grunt work for you. So um, make sure you're telling it correctly. Okay, I want to switch over to the notes sheet, and we have some applications we're going to look at, and I actually really like these, and I think you will too, because you're going to start to see how the statistics is going to connect to real world situations more so. Um, right now, we're doing these, but we don't have a context. In the applications, we're going to have a context, and I think um, you'll find it's reinforcing, and it's going to make a lot more sense as to why we care. Okay, let me just pause this for a sec while I pull up the... Okay, so this is the second um, page of your notes sheet, and I want you to notice it says for the following, draw a picture and then calculate the probability um, using a calculator. Um, I should also say be sure to show what calculator function you used. So um, again, these, what's going to be different is they're not going to be standard normal. They're not 
And I think I might want that a little skinnier. They're not standard normal. So your mean and your standard deviation, those values are going to be um, a little bit different. Okay, so the first one, we looked at a problem kind of similar to this before. It says IQ scores are normally distributed. The mean is 100, the standard deviation is 15. So we're going to draw our picture first. So we know we have this normal distribution. And it has a mean of 100 now. And a standard deviation of 15. Okay, and we did a problem with the empirical rule um, going one standard deviation each direction and then two standard deviations. Um, we're going to do this now um, without having to do empirical rule. So it says find the probability. So we want to find the probability that an adult has an IQ less than 130, smaller than 130. Now the other problems we used Z because our number line, our Z scale, has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. It's our standard scale. We're just going to use an X for these because it's not a Z scale. If you were, if you put a Z, it, I wouldn't mark it wrong. What I'm concerned with is can you find the probability? And we want it to be less than 130. So now on our picture, we can see in the middle is our 100. So maybe 130 is like here, that's pretty high IQ. And we're gonna say, what's the probability it's less than 130? So we're looking at that shaded area, which would represent the probability. You can see it's fairly large. Our work is gonna be normal CDF. We're trying to find a probability, right? We have numbers down here. This boundary over here is going to keep going and going to negative infinity. So we're going to go negative 9999. So the left or the lower boundary is that. The upper boundary is 130. Now the mean is not zero. The mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. And what's really nice about this is your calculator is going to standardize this for you. It basically converts these to z-scores and then does does the work when you put the mean and the standard deviation in there, which is nice. Um, something that sometimes comes up in this problem, see how we chose negative 9999? Do you think anybody could have an IQ of negative 9999? You could probably put zero in there. Like, I don't even know if you could have an IQ of zero. So in that sense, sometimes students say, well, why are you choosing that? Well, we want to make sure that we go far enough um, in the negative infinity direction. So even if you had chosen zero, you would get the same answer. It's just easier to just always choose that negative number. Okay, so if you put this in your calculator now, you're going to get 0.9772 which is telling you most people have IQs less than 130. The probability that your IQ is less than 130 is 0 0.9772. Just to think about here, what if I wanted to find that probability, this side? What do the probabilities add up to? Yep. They add up to one. So if you were trying to find the other side, you could either go from 130 to the positive or you could subtract it from one. If they ask you for a percentage, move the decimal two places and there's your percent. Okay, next one. Find the probability that a selected adult has an IQ between 110 and 120. So again, we know we have a normal distribution. We know our mean is 100 and our standard deviation is 15. And we want to find the probability that an adult has an IQ between 110, so 100's here, so maybe 110's like right here, and 120. That little slice. Okay. 
the way we would write that, the probability that the IQ is in between 110 and 120. If this doesn't get written down correctly, I'm not going to penalize you. What's important is your picture and being able to calculate the probability. So normal CBF, the left boundary, the lower number, the higher number, the mean, the standard deviation. And then you would put that in your calculator. And we get 0.1613. So a fairly small 16%. Is that unusual? No, it's not less than 0.05. So you can see the key theme of everything we've done is probability. All right, letter C. Now this one has percentiles. This tends to bug people. I'll show you, it's not that bad. It says, says, oh, this is the IQ score separating the bottom 60% from the top 40%. So remember when we talked about percentiles, we said the percentile tells you what percent is below you. So if we draw that picture, and again, I can think of that as a number line. We're still talking about the IQ. So the mean is 100, the standard deviation is 15. And it says we want the IQ score separating the bottom 60% from the top 40. So remember when we used to do it like this, and then we say, okay, we're going to have, you know, 60% here and 40% there. Ran out of room. So 60% are below. Well, we know that's 50%, right? So it's going to be maybe like here. And this area, they told us, is 60%. And this area is 40%. And we're trying to find, I need a little more space to put my little box there. Um, we're going to be trying to find what IQ score would cut off the bottom 60% and the top 40%. Well, look at the picture. 100 is in the middle, so it's going to be higher than 100. You can see that. Notice, you don't know this number on the bottom. It's not asking you to find a probability. It's asking you to find a cutoff. So this is an inverse normal. This is what we're trying to find. So we want the area to the left, which would be 60%, but we want to write that as a decimal. When we work with percentages, we always write them as decimals. And then the mean is 100, and the standard deviation is 15. And again, that is the area to the left. Those tend to be tricky. And when we do this, we find out that that IQ score, go ahead and put it in your calculator, is 103.8. So that number that goes in there, let me get a different color, is 103.8. And you can see in our picture, it makes sense that it would be 103.8. If we got a number like 90, we'd know we did something wrong because it's in the wrong position. So on the percentile ones, it's telling you what percent is below. You're looking for a cutoff. Okay. Two more. Okay. Um, this problem is from the previous book that I used to use, and I like to choose it because you guys can't see me, but I'm really tall. Um, I'm almost six feet tall, five, five, eleven and a half, and um, everybody in my family is really tall. So um, I like to pick this problem for that reason. And it's called uh, the Beanstalk Club, which right away I think they need a new name. Um, a social organization for tall people. And it has a requirement that women must be, and, and it says at least, I'm going to say over, 
um, women must be at least 70 inches tall. Well, 70 inches, that's 5'10". Okay. I could join. Woo, lucky me. Um, it also asks us here, what percent of women meet that requirement? And it's, to, and it's implying like what percent of people, I guess, in the United States or I mean, I think, I think they're talking about Boston, like Boston Beanstalk Club. Um, what percent would qualify that would be over 5'10"? And it tells you women's heights are normally distributed. So you say, okay, I have my normal distribution with a mean of 63.6. That is 5'3", almost 5'4". I don't know how um, updated that is. And a standard deviation of 2.5, okay? So it's saying what percent of women can join that club? They meet the requirement of being at least um, 70 inches tall. So 63 is here, 70 is gonna be down here somewhere. It's higher. And they've got to be over 70 inches tall. Okay? So we're finding this area here. It asks for a percent. Let's find the probability first, and then we'll convert it to a percent. So we're trying to find the probability that a, a woman is greater than 70 inches tall. Okay? We have our picture. And again, when you look at this picture, it's going out to positive infinity. So we'll use 99999. And again, you're not going to have someone that has a height of 9,999 inches. I mean, you could probably put 100 inches there and you'd be fine. Um, this just is a good standard. We know it's far enough down there that it's going to work. So we'll do normal CDF. We're going, we're finding that area. We're going from the left to the right. Mean is 63.6 .6 and standard deviation is 2.5. And when we do that, you're gonna get a really tiny probability. So go ahead and put it in your calculator if you haven't already. If I asked you, is that unusual? Yes, it's unusual. It's less than 0.05. Definitely unusual. Very unusual for someone to be that tall, which, like I said, that kind of surprised me. Now, it asks for a percent. This is a probability. If we want to change that, because the question specifically asks for a percentage, we have to convert that to a percent. So we move the decimal two places to the right and it's gonna be 0.53%. So 0.5, half a percent. Those are the people that can join the club. So they're not gonna have very many women in that club. <laughs> they need to change their requirements. <laughs> okay. So this last one. Um, there's quite a few of um, you that are going into the medical field. So a lot of times people can relate to this or a lot of times people can relate to this problem um, because they've had children or they have siblings or they have cousins. So um, this one tends to be a problem a lot of people can relate to. And I'm going to go back to the blue. I like the blue. Birth weights are normally distributed. And again, that makes it predictable. If you have that normal distribution, we can make some predictions about what's going to happen. And it says the mean is 3,420 grams. We're used to pounds. I did the conversion and it's about seven and a half pounds for the average weight. And the standard deviation is 495. So the mean and the standard deviation is 495. It says the hospital plans to set up special observation conditions for the lightest 2% of the babies. 
they want to have a special nursery for the tinier babies to give them um, a little more attention in case something goes wrong. So it says the lightest 2%. So the lighter babies would be on this side. And we're getting the lightest 2%. And we want to find out what weight do we use for the cutoff? In other words, what weight are they going to use to determine does this baby go in the special nursery or not? Okay. 2% is 0.02. You can see here, we don't have a number down here. So if we're going to try to do normal CDF, you don't have the numbers on the bottom. You're trying to find that. So this one is an inverse normal. And you want to enter the area to the left, which is 0.02, the mean, and the standard deviation, 495. Okay. Notice this answer that we get better be smaller than 3,420, because these are tinier babies. Okay. When you do the inverse norm, you're going to get 2403. I just rounded it. And that's in grams, which I checked. That's um, a little over five pounds. Okay. So the babies that are around five pounds or smaller are going to go into the special observation nursery. Okay. Typically, students do better with the normal CDF ones, and there's more of them. What may happen to you, you're rolling along and you're doing all these problems and you're just all set, and then all of a sudden, they give you an inverse norm one and you get stuck. So again, the picture is critical. And even writing that little box, it seems silly, but it kind of triggers your brain to say, oh, this is an inverse norm. Also, area to the left, unless you have a TI-84. Also, don't forget to write your percent as a decimal, okay? And then your common sense can help you here too, because if we take that result and we put it over here, we can see it's logical. If we had a number that, that was bigger than 3420 and we tried to put it in there, we'd realize, wait, it's not making sense. Or if we got a negative weight, how can I have a negative weight? So big picture it and bring your common sense. Once you're done, make sure your answer makes sense in the context of the problem. Okay, so this is 6.2. You're all set with that. Um, I know we have one more um, section. We're going to be doing 7.3. It is very similar to this. So it's going to give you more practice with this. And the only difference is instead of looking at an individual, we're going to be looking at a group. So there's just one small thing that we're going to learn. So I would say really work on, this is an important section. You notice it's a little bit longer, the 6.2. You're going to find 7.3 is shorter. And if you understand this, 7.3 is just going to add one little thing to it when we're talking about a group. Okay, all set. And um, you can go ahead and work on your My Open Math and then your homework. Have a good rest of your day.